Okay, so we can officially get started then. Um, welcome to the Ocean County Historical Society's monthly online lecture series. It's usually in person, but taking place temporarily online, of course, due to the ongoing pandemic. My name is Melissa Ziobro. I am the Specialist Professor of Public History at Monmouth University, but importantly today, I am a trustee of the Ocean County Historical Society. So I am hosting today on behalf of our president, Brian Bavasso, who normally does such a wonderful job hosting when we are in person, and also on behalf of our wonderful programs committee, um, the hardworking Barbara Roish and uh, Mickey and Richard Kuntz and everybody involved there. So on behalf of everybody who put today's event together, thank you all so much for being here. These events, uh, you know, they are just one way that we are trying to accomplish our mission telling the stories of Ocean County, even in these highly unusual times that we are living in. So I'm joined here today by our guest star, Mary Rasa. She is a historian, a former National Park System interpreter, uh, former curator at Sandy Hook, formerly my boss at Sandy Hook when I interned for her. What We won't talk about how many years ago that was, Mary. Right? <laughs> but she'll be presenting today on Women Lighthouse Keepers. So Mary has some prepared remarks at the end of which we'll take questions and answers. Before we dive into Mary's prepared remarks though, does anybody have a question for me? We're good? All right then, take it away, Mary. Hello everybody. Um, so as Melissa said, my name is Mary Rasa. I worked at Sandy Hook as a park ranger and then museum curator from 1992 to 2009. Uh, I live in Maryland now because my husband uh, works for what was once at Fort Monmouth. Um, we work, we, we live near the proving ground now. So I spent um, a good number of years working in the Sandy Hook Visitor Center, which was a life-saving station. And, um, and I was the first park ranger to give tours of the lighthouse when we got it back from the Coast Guard because the Coast Guard wasn't letting anyone in it when we first get out there and we we brought um we brought some folks up there it was uh, a little bit around 1999 2000 when we first started giving some um, tours out there so through uh one of the books I just want to point out this book this is a book called the women who kept the lights and this is by Candace Clifford and her mother, Mary Clifford. Um, that really is the Bible of women lighthouse keepers. And then they came out with a second book called Mind the Lights, Kate. And this is more meant for uh, like a teenage audience or a young adult audience. So those two books are really what the foundation of learning more about women lighthouse keepers came from. Um, and so now I'm going to, but I want to explain the whole history of lighthouses because that really, you need to know background before you get into specifically women lighthouse keepers. So give me a second. I'm going to share my screen. So we're going to talk about the administrative history, lighthouse technology, the types of lighthouses, the keepers, and women lighthouse keepers during this program. So the first lighthouse in the United States was the Boston Lighthouse, was rebuilt in 1716. It was destroyed during the Revolutionary War. So the oldest lighthouse that exists from the colonial era is the Sandy Hook Lighthouse, built in 1764. So we like to call it the oldest lighthouse in the country because it is the oldest structure in the country. So um, shortly after colonial times, it, one of the first acts of Congress was to uh, establish a lighthouse service. And this was done in 1789. Um, in August 7th is considered lighthouse day. So it was one of the first acts of the new Congress and uh, the gentleman on this page is Albert Gallatin. He was the second secretary of the treasury. So Alexander Hamilton started us off uh, running lighthouses, but then Albert Gallatin got into a, a large amount of a lighthouse building period. 
Then after uh, that time period, Stephen Pleasanton, he, he took over from 1820 to 1852. He was the fifth auditor of the United States because the Secretary of the Treasury could no longer manage everything within uh, their purview. So it was given to the fifth auditor. He was known as, the whole time period was known as the error of the lowest bidder because they he took the lowest bid even if it was terrible. So a lot of lighthouses during that time period just fell down um, or, or needed to be rebuilt. So it wasn't considered a great time period, but the United States was expanding so rapidly. By 1820, we had gotten Florida. The entire West Coast soon had to be uh, taken care of with lighthouses, but the entire Gulf and Florida, which is a huge amount of area. And he is the credited as the first one to appoint women lighthouse keepers. He knew that they knew what they were doing because they were almost always, they were either the wife or the daughter of a keeper. So the lighthouse board took over after Stephen Pleasanton and it became a more military service from 1852 to 1910. Um, it was run by officers, military officers take took care of districts. Nice. So we were looking at the third district, which is New Jersey up to Rhode Island. Each district had an officer in charge of it and they would check on each of the light, the light structures. And at this point in time, they listed uh, the lights and the fog signal, signal. So all mariners would have had this book on their ship with them and they would have been able to say, okay, I'm approaching New York Harbor. Well, I'm looking for the Sandy Hook Lighthouse, which is a white tower with a John red Yates. top. Who? John Yates. Oh yeah. What happened? Hi everyone. I would just ask that you please make sure you are on mute and I'm just double checking that also. But if you could all make sure you're on mute, that's very helpful. Thank you. Go ahead, Mary. Okay. So uh, they would know the day mark of a lighthouse was the color. So light, Sandy Hook is white with a red top. Over on Coney Island, it would have been white with a black top. So they would know where they were um, off the coast by looking at this light chart. So after that time period, the Bureau of Lighthouses took this 1910 to the creation of the Coast Guard. Uh, it was also then called the United States Lighthouse house service. So 1939 is when the Coast Guard took over the service. So at that point in time, there were 5,200 employees, there were 30,000 aides to navigation, and it was July 7th of 1939. The Coast Guard was created in 1915 from the merger of the U.S. Life Saving Service and the Revenue Cutter Service. So the lighthouse technology, this is sort of an interesting feature. We went from basically creating a fire to trying to figure out what type of oils would work best, what type of lamps. There's the pan lamp where there are many lights, the spider wicks, which uh, would create a large amount. And then the last one was the Aragon lamp and reflector prior to getting a Fresnel lens with uh, incandescent oil vapor, which is basically what today's uh, kerosene is. So I'm just gonna skip this and show a quick little, um, quick video. Give me a second here. Can you hear that? Okay. So that's the oil going into the structure. Let's get it a bit louder, Mary. And a little louder if you have it. It's okay. We can see the visuals. Okay. 
I just wanted to show what it looked like when they were lighting it. Um, we'll go back to the presentation. So the Statue of Liberty is shown in this picture because this was the first electric lighthouse in the country. We started off with the different types of, of uh, lighting elements and ended with the Statue of Liberty. Um, the lighthouse, it was really considered a lighthouse only for a very short amount of time because Fort Wood, which it's sitting on, was an army fort and the army did not like having the lighthouse service there. So they realized it wasn't really a necessary aid to navigation. After a few years, it was uh, deemed no longer a lighthouse. Fresnel basically changed the way lighthouses were being used. Um, he invented the Fresnel lens in 1822, and this revolutionized transportation because his beehive-like structure um, intensified that small bulb and it could be seen to the horizon, which was about 20 miles out. The ocean going ones were seen far, far away. So this was an extremely important thing that was developed. It was first used in Europe, he was French, and it was not brought to the United States until 1840. And that also goes with Stephen Pleasanton being the heir to Lois Bitter. He didn't want to spend the money on them. Uh, so what happened was mariners started complaining and eventually they were able to get the first order lens. This is at Twin Lights in Highlands. Um, it's on display in the, uh, the generator room. And this is a first order lens. It's about eight feet tall. So in 1840, they brought this light. They were gonna place it at Sandy Hook but it was too big for the lanthorn room at Sandy Hook. So they, they said, well, six miles away, we have another lighthouse and they put it there. So before this was a country, there were 12 lighthouses built. They were either made out of wood or stone and um, they basically all failed um, except for there's like three left. Then the next period was the early federal era from 1789 to 1820. And there's a few lighthouses that remain from that time period. They got a little bit better at taking care of those lighthouses. They were more, um, they were with cut stone and brick as opposed to wood, which burned and uh, rubble stone, like Sandy Hook lighthouses made um, out of its natural stone, it wasn't precisely cut like it was done in later time period. So 11 of these ones stand from this time period, the early federal era. Stephen Pleasanton with all of his uh, cheapness, I guess you would wanna say, he, um, he built, these lighthouses were built and they were rebuilt and then they were rebuilt again in, in some cases. This one is a Matinicus rock, which is, far off the coast of uh, Maine. This was the second of three lighthouse sets that were built out there and uh, they failed. Another type of lighthouse is the protected screw pile lighthouse. This is Drum Point in Maryland. It sits at a maritime museum, a Calvert Maritime Museum. And uh, the first one of these types was developed in New Jersey. It was at Brandywine Shoals, which is in the Delaware Bay. And um, that was in 1850 and it was done by General Meade who also did Barnegat. So this basically sunk the iron into the soil. The one in Brandywine was an issue because it was in open waters and ice flows could get up in it and take it out. So the ones that exist from this time period and this type of variety are mostly in the Chesapeake Bay because the Chesapeake Bay's waters were a lot more protected. So then they created the exposed screw pile, which could be, basically they were developed for Florida because the first lighthouses built there, they did them with stone and brick. And what happens in Florida's uh, soil is that they mostly collapsed. So this lightweight weight iron could be put off the coast and it could go into the water and it wouldn't be destroyed. The other type was the cast iron lighthouses, as you can see on the, the right hand side there. Uh, one of these lighthouses is very famous. It's 
the Little Red Lighthouse under the Great Gray Bridge, which is a children's book. And this sits under the George Washington Bridge. Originally, this lighthouse was one of the five that were at Sandy Hook. It was called the North Beacon. The next building phase was when they had the engineer corps of the army involved. And these were the brick tall towers. And there are 15 of these. Then there were light ships and the light ships were in places where um, they couldn't have, they had no point of land. So the very first one was put in Willingboro Spit, which was the entrance to the Chesapeake Bay in the Norfolk area. Um, the Sandy Hook one was the first one put in open waters. The last phase of lighthouse building were uh, the light ships were the light ships were a problem because the light ships could be taken down by storms. They had a large crew on them and uh, they rocked a lot. They had no way to navigate or sail. They were actually anchored and they couldn't move. So they were a, a big target for um, large ships. And there were four instances when they were destroyed by ships coming in, accidentally, of course. But to explain the, the uh, progression, you can see the Sandy Hook Lighthouse is the light ship. And then they built the Ambrose Light Tower, which is the Texas Tall Tower, which was based on the oil platforms that they were building starting just after World War II. So that tower had obviously that they got their crews back and forth by helicopter. They had automated it at one point and then a ship hit it. It was standing on three of the four posts and then um, they replaced it by another tower which was then hit by another ship. So that little yellow buoy there is what stands at the entrance to the major, the largest uh, port in the country at New York Harbor. You see that little buoy now. So what did a lighthouse keeper do? Well, they had a lot of assignments. They, their main duty was to light at sundown and extinguish in the morning. They were responsible for shining the lens and the, every, all the equipment and polishing. They maintained a daily log so that everybody knew what was going on. And they were also responsible for fog signals. So they had a, a very large amount of things to do and generally the entire family was involved in taking care of it. So you would have your, the husband would be the keeper, the wife, may or may not be paid as a keeper, assistant keeper. They might, in a lot of cases, they just didn't pay them, but they knew that they'd be doing those duties. And then you would have your sons and your daughters helping out. Most of the time you were on a remote area, you had to feed yourself. So they generally had um, livestock, they would have pigs, they had chickens. They went clamming. When we were doing archeology span at the Sandy Hook Lighthouse, we came across uh, pig bone, uh, pig jaw bones, and a lot of mussels, a lot of clam shells, and a lot of liquor bottles. Many, many liquor bottles were found under the barn. So we knew what they were up to. Um, they generally had large families, and those large families were all responsible. They would have to paint the tower. Uh, that was their job, painting the tower, painting the, the keeper's house. And for that, they didn't get paid a whole lot of money, but they got to live there. It was rent free. There was a whole system where they would be resupplied by lighthouse tenders. They brought them coal. They got brought them things for both the tower and then for themselves. So they got some supplies. There were things like um, libraries that were sent in boxes to each of the tower, each of the towers, especially if they had children. Uh, they were sent medicines. They were sent many different supplies to keep them happy, alive and to augment what they could find from the local community because in a lot of cases, they were pretty remote. So this is a picture of at Sandy Hook. This was the Stanton family. The Stanton family, um, Keeper Stanton is the gentleman sitting down. So his entire family would have been involved. And we have a very interesting letter that I'm gonna to read to you uh, that is in the collection of uh, Sandy Hook. So, 
So the letter goes, I am sorry that I have to call on you, but I am tired of the constant abuse of the keeper. This is written by the assistant keeper. I have taken it for two years without saying anything before. He is the most profane man at times that I have ever heard talk. He cursed me and called me very vile names a great many times for no cause whatsoever. And if there's any way of stopping it, I would like to have it done. I don't want you to injure the man in any way for he has a very large family to support and a nice family too. I only want the abuse stopped. I think he will tell you that I am not able to do the work here, but I do more than my fair share of regular work and have done it all the time. Captain, if you can give me one of the small lights to tend, I would feel very grateful to you, but I would like to be myself by myself and away from this man. Should a vacancy occur in Staten Island or the New Jersey shore, I would be consider it a great favor if you would give it to me. I am the man Mr. Wex spoke to you of who lost a leg in the Battle of Coal Harbor. It was signed Charles Brewer, assistant keeper, Hook Beacon, Sandy Hook. So he was a veteran of the Civil War uh, and he, he was without one leg. So the response was written to Mr. William Stanton, the keeper, the fact that you and the assistant keeper are on bad terms has been reported to me by the assistant inspector. If either of you has cause for complaint against the other, the remedy lies in reporting the offense to the inspector, not in an interchange of abusive language. The assistant has been instructed that he must comply with the regulations of the lighthouse establishment and obey the lawful orders of the keeper but you and he are strongly admonished that quarreling under any circumstances will not be allowed very respectively. So he was a commander in the US Navy who wrote that letter back to him. So not everything was peaceful and quiet at these remote locations. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the women of the lighthouse service. So they were the wives and daughters of the keepers. There were 140 were officially keepers, but there were countless unofficial keepers at the 600 lighthouse stations in the United States. But many, many more were considered assistant keepers to their husbands, to their fathers, and they were paid. So they did, uh, the position of lighthouse keeper was the second job open to women in the federal government, the first being clerk. So it was the first non-office job open to women in the federal government. So the first lady we're gonna talk about is Ida Lewis. And Ida Lewis has the distinction of being the only woman to, well, the only lighthouse keeper to have a lighthouse named after her. It's called, it was originally called the Lom, Lime Rock Lighthouse. It is in Rhode Island. She performed 18 rescues um, and countless more that were probably unrecorded. But she was at Lime Rock Lighthouse from 1857 to 1911. She received an official appointment in 1879. Her father had suffered a stroke uh, soon after his appointment in 1857. So she took it on and was not officially considered keeper for a number of years. She was the oldest of four children. She was a skilled boat handler for her daily chore of rowing her brothers and sisters to school on the mainland. Her schooling was never completed because she had to be the keeper now for her father. So, in a lot of cases, the children of keepers were um, either homeschooled at the site or they would stay with a local community in a, in a town nearby for the school term. Those are your two choices. Uh, if they were lucky enough to have a school nearby, they obviously could do it. So Ida was responsible for getting her siblings to and from school each day. So she made her first rescue at the age of 15 and she's credited with saving 18 lives. There's a very famous photograph uh, painting that was done in 1869 of her saving soldiers from Fort Adams. And she became very famous for that. And she was on the cover of Harper's Weekly. Um, and she received the president, presidential visit from US Grant. There is a there was an active debate during this time period whether it was proper for women to row. But then they determined, well, I guess if it was okay for them to row if they saved people's lives. After her death, the lighthouse, lighthouses in the US are all named for the spot of land that they're sitting on. 
So in order for them to change the name of the lighthouse, they named, they renamed that plot of land Ida Lewis Rock. And then they were able to change the, the title of the lighthouse to her name. It's the, this still sits as a yacht club and it is a private aid to navigation. Abbey Burgess Grand is um, well known because there was a book written about her that was called Keep the Lights Burning Abbey. So she served at Matinicus Rock, which is 20 miles off the coast of Maine. So it was a rather unpleasant place to be. She was assistant keeper to her father from 1853 to 1872. And then she was with her husband at the Whitehead Light Station in Maine from 1875 to 1890. She was never a head keeper. And uh, at the age of 17 in 1856, her father had to get supplies because the lighthouse tender used to come every April and September. It never came in September. So by January, they were running out of all their supplies. So dad got in his boat and went to shore in January, just as storms raged for weeks. They washed everything on that island away and her family at some points in time had to go into the towers to be saved. So it was completely flooded. Her mother was an invalid. She had two younger sisters. She got them into the towers her father did not return for an entire month. So she was responsible not only for the safety of her family, but also getting those lights lit every night. And she did so. There's a whole story about how she um, saved all the chickens but one. And they basically were rationed on eggs during a time period that the, the, the land was basically gone and they couldn't get um, any more provisions. So in 1860, dad lost his appointment as the keeper, but she was considered assistant keeper. She stayed on because he lost it because Abraham Lincoln was elected and he was a Democrat. So that still happens to that. that even back then, they, they did those type of things. Uh, so the new keeper came and she married the keeper's son and she got a salary of $440. This is by 1860. Her husband then got his own lighthouse in 1875 and she was paid $480 as the keeper and they stayed there till 1890. In 1998, the Coast Guard commissioned a number of buoy tenders and one was named after her, the Abbey Burgess. It had an 18 man crew and it serviced 400 aides to navigation. And she was that, that little red dot there is where uh, that lighthouse was. Kate Walker was somewhat famous because she was at a lighthouse in the middle of New York Harbor. And uh, she was the keeper of the Robins Reef Light Station, which was off the coast of Staten Island. If anybody's gone on a cruise ship from the terminal up in Bayonne, it's right there. I got a whole bunch of pictures last year when, uh, when we went on our cruise in 2019. And I said, oh, that's Robins Reef. So that, that was kind of exciting. Um, so this lighthouse, she was in charge of from 1890. She lived there from 1890 to 1919. So this type of lighthouse is considered a coffer dam because they sink it into the water. And it's basically the way they build bridges uh, with the structure going into the water and displacing the water. Her, this lighthouse was built in 1883 of iron. It's 56 feet tall and it has a fourth order lens. So it's much smaller than something at, like at Twin Lights or Barnegat Lighthouse. Her husband, John Walker, was an assistant at the Sandy Hook North Beacon, and which was the little red lighthouse before it got moved under the George Washington Bridge. Uh, then she met, um, she met her husband on Sandy Hook. She was a waitress at the boarding house that was there, and she was a German in immigrant. She had a young son with her, and uh, her husband took his meals at the boarding house. And uh, in 1885, she was, they were both sent to Robins Reef. His salary was $600 a year. And Kate was considered his assistant at the time. And she uh, was often, New York newspapers would come out and talk to her because of her unique position there. 
She said, when I first came to Robin's Reef, the sight of the water, which I looked in every way, made me lonesome. I refused to unpack my trunks at first, but gradually, little by little, I unpacked. After a while, they were all unpacked and I stayed on. So in 1890, John got pneumonia and her son rode him to the mainland. And the last thing that was said to her was, mind the lights, Kate. He died 10 days later. Several men were, uh, came out to the location to look at it for their job and none of them wanted it because it was so remote. Um, so at the age of 42, she had two, two children that were living with her and she applied for the job. She was only four foot 10 and not even 100 pounds. The Lighthouse Board was not giving these type of appointments to women, but they were desperate. So what they did is they paid her as a laborer till 1894. Then finally in 1894, she got her appointment as official keeper. And uh, her son, then when he became of age, he became her assistant keeper. She's known to have rescued as many 50, as 50 people by launching her dinghy. If you can see in the photograph of the lighthouse, the black and white photograph, you can see the rowboat. So that had to be uh, put into the water by pulley system. And that's how she went out and rescued people. So she also had to climb that steel rung ladder to get up to her home. In one instance, she saved five crew members and she, one of the reporters came and they, they spoke to her around that time period from New York Times. She said she never had time to get lonesome. I have meals to get regularly, although there's often nobody but myself to eat them. Her son had moved into the city with his family. Then there are beds to be made, floors to scrub, windows to clean, the lamp in the tower. It is more difficult to care for than a family of children. It need not be wound more than once every five hours, but I wind it every three hours so to take no chances. In 19 years, the light has never disappointed sailors, which had depended on it. Every night I watch until 12 o'clock. Then if all goes well, I go to bed, leaving my assistant, which was her son, in charge. I am always up to put the light out at sunrise. Then I post my log from which monthly reports go to the government. We have to put everything down from the amount of oil consumed to the state of the weather. Every day I clean the brass of the lamp and every month I polish the lens. The latter is a two days job. So Kate in 1996 uh, had a buoy tender named for her. So I live down in the Chesapeake Bay now and the last woman lighthouse keeper in the United States was stationed at the Turkey Point Lighthouse. Um, she was at a lighthouse that had 85 years with a woman keeper, which was extremely unusual. So Fanny um, made it from oil to electric, which eventually is the reason why it was automated and she was out of a job, but she was, she was rather old by that point in time. So she was the last civilian lighthouse keeper um, from 1925 to 1947. So her husband died in 1925. She was beyond the age of service and with new regulations, they weren't allowing any women lighthouse keeper because they thought that the foghorns um, and the apparatus for the foghorns was too difficult for women to manage. She appealed to her senator who then got Calvin Coolidge involved and he agreed that it was okay for her to be keep the keeper. A lot of her daily duties still exist in the National Archives and uh, she talks about lighting a lamp and the foghorn and keeping it clean. Her excerpts generally talk about cyclic maintenance of painting the tower. Um, she raised chickens, lambs, and sheep and she also there was an incident where on two occasions the fog bell malfunctioned and she rang the bell manually till the ship had passed. Her lighthouse was between the Chesapeake Bay and the C and D canal which connects the Chesapeake to the Delaware. So there are very large ships continue to go through that area. Um, in 1943 Turkey Point was electrified which made things a little bit easier. And during the war, she had uh, received a radio telephone set uh, to communicate the weather and potential enemy sightings. 
So she left in 1947. She died in 1966 at the age of 83. This particular lighthouse was deactivated in 2000. So I just want to talk a little bit about your local lighthouses there in Ocean County. Uh, Barnegat only had uh, one woman listed for about a year as a keeper, so there wasn't a whole lot of women lighthouse keeper information about that. But that was uh, during the whole period where uh, military officers who were engineers were designing towers. So the first tower was built during the era of the lowest bidder. It was way too short to be seen out at sea. So the new tower, which ended up being 172 feet, uh, was, was built with the first order lens. Because of the shifting sands there, it was finally decommissioned in 1927 because they really were unsure that it was going to stay standing. So that particular lighthouse had a keeper and two assistant keepers. So it was a triplex, the house that did exist there. And it was the largest building in the area. Now Tucker's Island Lighthouse, which doesn't stand any longer, that had a more interesting history as far as the family was concerned. The first tower uh, existed, but then it was replaced by the one that is basically a house with a tower coming out of it. And that was given a fourth order lens because fourth order lenses were for harbors and for smaller bodies of water in 1867. So it was, the light was deactivated just a month prior to it falling down and being destroyed because of, as, as with everywhere else, shifting sands. So the Ryder family was in charge of the lighthouse the entire time that it stood from 1867 to 1927. Mary and his wife had 21 children, uh, 13 of them survived, several of them were keepers and, and then their children were as well. Uh, so they remained on that site for 60 years. So Arthur Ryder was the last keeper and he was there till 1927. Um, one of the sisters, Amanda, was an assistant keeper officially as well, but everybody on that in that household would have helped to maintain the lighthouse. So the pictures of the destruction of the lighthouse were taken by the grandson of the original keeper, who was the nephew of the keeper at the time. So that's just a little bit of local history in Ocean County. I'm going to talk about the Sandy Hook family that was there for quite a long time. This is uh, the Patterson family. So this is Charles Patterson. Charles Patterson was from Hal Township, New Jersey. He, his, he had five brothers. His five brothers all went to serve in the Civil War. And he was rejected because he had varicose veins. And he wanted to serve some way. So he uh, applied to and was given the, the job of being the keeper at the Sandy Hook Lighthouse. His, his brothers did all return from the 14th New Jersey Regiment, which was from Freehold, New Jersey. So he came out here in 1861 out to Sandy Hook and he remained there until 1884 and he died the, the year thereafter. His, this is a, what happened with, this is an interesting story in that when I took over as the museum curator in 2000, I was asked to do a small lighthouse display, which is how I found all these other artifacts. And one of the things that I found were a series of letters that were written between himself and his sister. And uh, she was an assistant lighthouse keeper. And that's how we found out about her story was from these letters that were donated from the Patterson family. Once I found the Patterson family, I took my intern from Monmouth University out to uh, the family's home and they, it was, it was uh, there's two houses that still stand that were Patterson family. His house is still standing. And then the, the family that I met was living in Sarah's house, which is where he had grown up. And they uh, relayed more information about the family. This is Trevonian, who was Charles's son. And he was in the life-saving service, service. He was a keeper at the Sandy Hook station. He was there for a number of years, and then he became an officer in the Reverend and Marine, which then became part of the Coast Guard. The painting that's in, in here was another one of Charles's sons is believed to have painted it. He was a painter. His name was Franklin, and uh, the family donated that item to us. When they did the archaeology in 2000 at the site, they found clamshells, which had oil paints in them that were similar to the colors. So 
we we are not they weren't positive but they believed that that was his palette and he was using those paints so in that image you can see there's a cow there's some pigs and uh there's a there's a, a chicken coop in the picture as well the keeper's house that exists at Sandy Hook today was built in 1883. And in the image, you can see two keeper's houses because that keeper's house was the third keeper's house that was built. So they were there from, they would have lived in the second one and then moved into the third one just before uh, they left. So we can date that to probably about 1883. So Sarah was Charles's sister. Sarah's husband died and her two children died in infancy so she um she asked to become the assistant keeper and she was granted the position and she lived with the family there as well as her house and how and the letters that we have between the two of them one of them would be at home and how and one would be at the lighthouse and i have a letter that i'm going to read to you that was written by charles to his sister it's from 1875 she and just uh, so this is her appointment certificate in 1867 and she was paid $360. So Sarah was back at home and her brother wrote, I thought perhaps a letter from the hook would be worth reading. He has just finished seeing to the lamps for he has to attend them first. He always holds the chimney for him. He's speaking about his young child. He said tonight that it was Aunt Sarah's lamp and to make it shine. He turned it out the first time he ever touched it. The ice still hangs. This is from February. I should point out this is February. The ice still hangs out on tonight when I lighted the lamps. You could not see any clear water except to see. I don't see much of the fort, folks. It is too cold. They don't have much. The lights have behaved very well so far, but I have took the test of love. The ice doesn't melt and you can see nothing but ice. Today is the first day that Ed, which was his young son, had a run on the sand. He was in great glee. He had clam chatter for dinner today and Frank got Ed to sleep before it was ready. He did not wake up till we was done and then you should have seen him eat. He cleaned one of his big plates. He, his appetite seems good. We are nearly as bad off as Robinson Caruso, but we have got plenty to eat except potatoes and they are getting low and I could sell some if we had them. The Parkertown folks come here every day they was down today and got five loads by cutting holes in the ice and fishing them out of nets. So that just gives you a capture of what was going on in life at the lighthouse. And there's your certificate. And now, uh, so the Sandy Hook Lighthouse is still active. It's still an active date made aid to navigation. So just if you're ever curious what happened when uh, the war came around in the in World War II, they had to douse the lights. So um, anything within five miles of shore was doused. But at Sandy Hook, this is an interesting image because they actually painted the tower to look like a house at the base. Um, it was in 1942 that they were dousing the lights. So it looked like they did that first and then they weren't allowing, they had blackout curtains and all those type of things. So that's just an interesting little aspect. I'm gonna show, I'm gonna get out of the share and I'm gonna show some really short videos. Does anybody have any questions before I show the videos? We had a question in the chat about how the children were educated, but I think you answered that. Anybody else wanna ask a question while Mary's pulling up her videos? Mary, where's the cemetery where Sarah Patterson was buried. Um, it is. It was a section of how it was. It's Ardenia. I think it's a Delphi. It's in. Well, I think it's almost in Farmingdale. I'd have to okay. look up. It was. It's a. Uh, if you the Patterson Farms are there, they're greenhouses, and it's right mm -hmm. on that road. Okay. Um, no, I was just curious. You know where they were buried. Yeah, it was across the street from the church, and I think it was Ardenia, but I'm not positive. Oh, I think I know where that might be. 
Okay. Yeah, it's been, okay. A, that was before I had Melissa as an intern. So that, that's going back to about 2000. <laughs> oh, okay. So I have to jog my memory on that one. <laughs> okay. We're talking about years now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks Doreen for your question. Anybody else have another question while Mary's looking for her videos? Getting those teed up? Okay, are you ready then, Mary? Uh, they just disappeared on me, give me a second. <laughs> I'll just say while you're queuing them up, um, wonderful presentation. You're obviously so passionate and so knowledgeable. Um, I think my favorite parts were reading from the letters. I love hearing um, their voices right out of the archives and then hearing about the archaeology that you did out on Sandy Hook right in in various places you know how you're able to use what other people might just overlook as garbage right to help interpret the lives of these people so fascinating to me I'm sorry I just lost the videos I will get them in two seconds <laughs> Anybody else want to unmute yourself for a question? You're welcome to go ahead and unmute, or if you put it in the chat, I'd be happy to read it for you. Melissa, when did the Sandy Hook, when did the Jerry's Hook light leave Sandy Hook and go up to the George Washington Bridge? I think it was about 1880. Or probably 1890, I think. That was um, so basically at Sandy Hook, there were there the main lighthouse had an east beacon and a west beacon. So they would then line up with the with the main lighthouse. And then there was also the north beacon, which was the Jeffreys Hook one. So they just determined that they didn't need all of those. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question, Linda. Anyone else? I see a question in the chat. What did women do during their leisure time? It sounds like they didn't have much leisure time, <laughs> but when they did have leisure time and they weren't, you know, polishing the brass, what were they doing, Mary? Um, I would say that they were, it would be knitting and I, they, you know, they also went fishing and they were providing for their families. It was, it was a rough, a rough life. Um, so I would say that they were taking care of sewing, they were taking care of their children. A lot of times they were educating their children as well. So they, I would say there probably wasn't a whole lot of leisure time, but they were at, remember they were at the beach, so they would probably enjoy some of that as well. Okay, okay. I, you found hang on a second. I, can you hear that at all? Just barely, I, I'll need you to make it as loud as you can. Okay. Can you see it? Not yet, you'll have to share. Okay, okay. All right, give me a second. I have my technical difficulties here. We're all <laughs> learning the ways of this new Zoom world we find ourselves in. Um, here's a question while you're working the tabs there. Did any of them write about their experience in the form of a biography? I have not found any. Okay, I do see a video. Okay, so this is British. We can't and this is a woman lighthouse keeper. Mary, we can't hear the audio. Does it go any louder? It doesn't. Well, we'll get a feel for the visual for a couple seconds then. Okay, but well, I just want to show what this this poor woman in England had to do every day at two lighthouses. Oh, wow. Well, just just imagine somebody British saying. She's just, they're just explaining that, that she's going into tens of the lighthouses. So this is the old, this is the old system. This isn't even using uh, the Fresnel lens. So Mary, as we're watching, the United States was not unique in employing women as lighthouse keepers? The, the United States stopped employing women as lighthouse keepers in 1947. Okay. With a, Fanny Salter was the last one. The last lighthouse keeper, 
the human lighthouse keeper left in 1989 and he was at Coney Island. Okay. And we're watching a British video here. So other countries, right. The British, the British continued to use uh, keepers much longer and they didn't automate their lights. The United States was really automating lights uh, much earlier. Let me just grab another video for you. Okay, so this is the Sandy, they're gonna talk about, this was 1939, this is also a British production, but they're just explaining in 1939, the Coast Guard took over all the lighthouses and they're showing Boston Light, which was the first, but it was knocked down during the Revolutionary War. So it was rebuilt thereafter. Most lighthouses were pretty much uh, automated it when electricity became prevalent. Some places it took longer to get electricity out to them. So they still had keepers later. This is a pic image of Fanny Salter at uh, Turkey Point Lighthouse going in and taking care of her lighthouse. So that was before it was automated. Does she have a dress on? Yes. <laughs> Yes, she did. Yeah, so that, that I'm not going to show the last one because you actually need to hear it. Um, but so 1989 was the actual last, last keeper. So the lighthouse that I worked at um, down here in Maryland, they automated 1975. What they basically, they, they automated 1927, but they sold it off and it was no longer an age navigation. They were putting in small lights all over the um, all over the country that were just a, a stick with a light on it, and that replaced most of the historic lighthouses. So in the early 2000s, there was this huge program where um, GSA is the government services agency, which takes anything that's surplus from the from any other government agency, and then they sell them. So a lot of lighthouses in the Hudson. Uh, river going up north uh, were getting sold to whoever would renovate them. And this happened throughout the country, uh, but that was more prevalent. There were a bunch of them in Hudson area. So they were trying to get rid of them and have somebody else maintain them because they cost a lot of money to maintain. Question here in the chat, Mary, it says in your first video showing filling the oil lamp and then climbing the circular stairs it mentioned and showed a straight ladder and called it an escape ladder. Was that common? I don't recall seeing a similar setup when I have visited lighthouses. Well, that first of all, that was in England. And uh, they generally, there's a circular tower and then a small ladder. Sandy Hook has it. Um, a lot of lighthouses have the circular. And then at the top, like the last 10 steps are straight. OK. Then I have another question. This is an interesting one. Um, did the women encounter resentment from men who felt that they didn't deserve to have those jobs? Lighthouses are so remote that I haven't found any information to say that there was a lot of resentment because most of those men didn't want to be out there. It, it, you know, you really, you had to have invested in you, your family, this was your home. This was where you were raising your children. Dad died or uh, I'm widowed. I still have these six kids to do something with and I can't get another job and I have a place to live. So they felt fortunate. You know, there are some lighthouses obviously that are in town, but um, I don't think there was much of an issue with that. And kind it of wasn't like the Women's Army Corps, which is another one of my programs. <laughs> a follow-up question in the chat. Um, so the women are pretty much getting jobs if men didn't want them, right? It wasn't like there was a big pool of applicants and the women were getting it. The women were getting the jobs because there were no men that wanted them. The women only got the job if dad or their husband died base or was, or was incapacitated. So a woman wouldn't become a, a keeper unless her family had already been involved in the situation. 
And if they could find an able-bodied man to replace them, they most likely did. Another question. Unless they play. Another question in the chat regards pay. Were they paid the same as men? Um, I haven't, because it's one replacing the other, I haven't found a comparison, but it was pretty similar. I mean, she got $360 as an assistant. I found some assistants that made a lot more in that time period. I guess it depended on how many assistants there were. Because in some, in some lighthouses, there would be three assistants. Some of them had no assistant. It really varied depending on how important your lighthouse was. Another question from the chat. Do you know of any lighthouses that were converted into private homes? Yes. Um, it, it's in the Hudson Bay. There's a couple of them. Um, there is one in the Marine, the, Cal the Calvert Marine Museum in Maryland has the Cove Point Lighthouse. They rent out the keeper's house to people to stay at. Uh, so that, that seems to be a, a, a function, but there are people that do live in some lighthouses. Now, as a historic preservation professional, how do you feel about that? If they can preserve, uh, you mean if people live in them, if they can preserve a tower that's gonna, what's gonna disappear, then great. A lot of them are, you know, pretty remote. So it, nobody wants them is the, the issue is they're so expensive to maintain that if somebody's willing to take that on, it also in a lot of historic places like on Gettysburg Battlefield, they've taken an old home and made it into a bed and breakfast in the state of Maryland, in some state parks, they have, uh, they call them, uh, they call them curators and they've taken over the building, renovated and made it into their home. And it seems to work. Okay, we have time for one more question. If anyone wants to unmute themselves or type it in the chat. I have one. Please. Well, actually it's more, it's more of a statement. Uh, if you look at the photo behind me, that's the Seagirt Lighthouse. And uh, Abram Yates uh, managed that, uh, and he passed away in 1910. And his wife, Harriet, wanted the job, and she did it for about four or five months, but she did not get the job. So she lost out. Wow. I just thought I'd mention huh. that. And I have other, uh, his, Abram was the son of William C. Yates, who was in the Civil War. And William C. trained as lighthouse keeper at Atlantic City Lighthouse. And he was permanent uh, keeper at Barnegat for a while. Uh, he died when he was keeping Cohansey Lighthouse and also Egg Island Lighthouse on, uh, on the Delaware. So I have uh, two relatives that were actually lighthouse keepers, which is my interest in lighthouse keeping in New Jersey. Awesome. I I thought I'd mention that about Harriet Yates. She didn't get the job. <laughs> oh, were you familiar with that story, Mary? No. See, we, even the experts can, are always learning something new. I love it. Thank you, John, for sharing. Well, you, you can Google, uh, just Google, Google Seagirt Lighthouse and the story is easily accessible online. Okay, awesome. Everyone will have to do that when we get off. Thank you, Mr. Yates, for sharing. Melissa, in, in Socrates, New York on the Hudson, we stayed there. It's a and b to raise money for the Lighthouse Conservancy. And the lighthouse keeper cooked breakfast on a stove made in Somerville at the Somerville Iron Works. Wow. It was great. Sorry. I love it. So many people in the audience have a personal connection to this. I love it. All right. Well, we do have to wind down. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, if you'll bear with me, I will just make one or two announcements on behalf of the Historical Society. We are open again with special hours and safety protocols. You can get all the information you need on our website, oceancountyhistory.org. I'd also note that you can donate on that website from the safety and comfort of your home if you are so inclined. We are an all volunteer organization and your donations are critical to our success. If you are a social media user, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram so that you can uh, stay abreast of all our future lectures and other programs. So with that, I wanna thank Mary so much. The clapping doesn't work out as well online as it does in person, but I'm clapping for you, Mary. Um, I learned so much and I really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you. And thank you thank all you. for joining us.
Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody.